Well, we want to welcome all of you out this evening. We're excited for Fred's presentation on no-till gardening. I look forward to this. That's a lot of work to till. And uh, so we're going to see if we can make this work. Well, thank you each for coming. And I hope we have an opportunity today to explore some principles of no-till gardening. I have to tell you honestly, I've only really been playing with it for the last three years. But every time you use a raised bed, you're really doing no-till because at least I don't turn over my raised beds. I harvest, I turn them back over. And square foot gardening techniques tell you basically that. They turn over one little teeny section enough to harvest, put some more amendment in that one little teeny section, and, and start again with planting. So if you've done any raised beds, you've already started practicing some of these techniques. Because there's two real big differences in the no-till area. And I'm going to, because I'm not showing handouts, I'm going to share the screen right now so everybody on Zoom and the video will get mostly uh, screen share. And then we're going to go with the principles that work with no-till gardening. Yeah, and you're welcome to turn off that light if that doesn't make any difference in here. Raised beds, I mentioned that, and we'll look at some other options of flat gardening in just a second, but how many of you have got raised beds of some kind? Barbara, what kind? Pallets, lumber, garage doors. Okay, so we'll talk about at least those. What kind of raised beds? Cement. Cement, not concrete block, cement. Okay, have you started playing yet? Any other? Just some fencing, wood stuff. Fencing? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. Welcome, guys. Just pull into any, any corner. So let's take a look at just some of the benefits first of no-till gardening and why no-till makes a difference. You're welcome to grab any chair you want to over here. Uh, Pros of no-till. For those of you who are getting tired of doing a lot of hard work, there is no backbreaking digging. Planting, preparation, or harvesting for the most part. And I'll give you an example in just a minute of harvesting potatoes without any digging, which we did last year and the year before. I happen to have three rototillers none of them have been used in three years. It's time for me to sell them, I think. There's no reason to have a small mantis, a medium-sized walk behind, and a tractor 62-inch tiller when none of them are getting used. <laughs> One of the greatest benefits of no-till is that the soil maintains moisture. And in our desert environment, that moisture retention is absolutely critical. And we'll look at some of the reasons why it maintains that moisture in just a moment here. How many of you have ever been tilling and saw half of an earthworm? Yeah. It's a little disconcerting that you want those guys working and yet you're cutting them in half over and over again. Are we familiar with fungal and bacterial pathways and the delivery of materials from one side of the garden to the other? Let's talk about that for just a minute because I don't have another slide on that. I watched a video of trees sharing materials. They fed a tree several hundred feet something unique 
and it wasn't the tree roots that delivered it to the rest of the clan, if I can call a tree group a clan, it was the fungal pathways that are developed underground. And so they share materials through those fungal pathways. When we till, we actually cut those pathways and block the sharing or balancing of materials from one side of the garden or one side of our raised bed to another side. So if you've got some beautiful manure in one corner with some great stuff, or maybe some worm castings in one corner with some great stuff, it actually gets shared across to the other parts of the garden and does a wonderful job of sharing those extra materials. What does nature do? Does nature actually ever disturb its own soil? Not unless a tree's tipped over or something like that by the wind. <laughs> but yeah, nature doesn't dig. Nature instead covers it with leaves and then the roots find where the materials are. So that's the, one of the other main things is those pathways of fungus delivery are undisturbed. Because, as we'll examine in a minute, we cover the soil with most processes of raised bed and it's a, a softer soil, we don't need to weed as much, which has made a huge difference because I don't get enough time outside in the garden like I would love and the weeds um, grow here quite helpfully. But with this method, the weeds really aren't in the garden area. The weeds are everywhere else in my yard. <laughs> but not the garden. Pesticides, while that's not specific to a raised bed function, I absolutely do not use any pesticides. And that's just simply because the guineas take care of what few squash bugs and other above ground pests there are and the methodology balances the soil so that things are healthier and they just don't need the pesticides there. Oh, a guinea hen. Guinea hens are the only bird that I've found so far that eats squash bugs. Have you ever squashed a squash bug? What does it smell like? It's the worst smell, and I don't blame chickens for not wanting to eat it, but guineas are so stupid, <laughs> they don't know that it smells bad, and they eat them anyway. Guineas are stupid in a lot of other ways, too, but that's another discussion. <laughs> Ask it again. Yeah, we've got guineas in the yard. Um, so we're on acre, roughly. Appropriate number of guineas for an acre would be three to four. And they are noisy. They're noisy. They're not as noisy if you only have three or four. <laughs> <laughs> but when you have 12, like we mistakenly did, and they fly over the fence, then they squawk at each other to, to let each other know where they're at. And, and then they're noisy. They're really annoying. <laughs> so, the, the benefits are it supports the natural soil balance. That's really one of the major benefits of no-till. The other big benefit to me is the labor saving difference. And I'll get more into that in just a moment. Cons, you do have to plan ahead. You've got to create the soil and our soil is not, um, back east, rained on, four foot deep, black soil. So you do have to dump a bunch of stuff in there initially, manure and, and leaves and things. And I don't know that you have to till it in the first time because I tried tilling it in the first two years. It didn't do a bit of good. I think just dump it on the top and let the earthworms distribute it is probably the better um, option because my areas that all I did is cover with six inches of um, 
mulch, pine bark, those kinds of things, it all mixed in. I'm having to recover those areas where I don't want weeds, but I'm not gardening. They're just beside rose bushes and stuff like that. Um, about every two to three years with another six inches because it all composts down and, and goes into the soil. So you do still have to take time to create healthy soil. That's not, um, it's not a bypass. There are some quicker ways to do it and I'll touch on those in just a moment here. And there's some great videos that I have found online. I didn't actually link to those videos, but we can find those. Uh, you do have to have a source for leaves, wood chips, manure, something to cover that with. Hay, straw, um, and it's just a matter of consistently looking every year or growing your own orchard and using the leaves there. One of the things I did uh, for the last two years is those healthy weeds we get instead of pulling them out and throwing them in, in the trash, I pull the weeds and put them as cover over future raised beds, which means you gotta wait a few years because you wanna let the seeds die and so forth. But I have had no weeds on that area. I covered it that thick with weeds <laughs> and I've had no weed problem in that area because it was covered thick enough. And you can always cover it with cardboard and weeds and still do that. So. So that's an option. It does take some time to learn a new method. I was raised, my dad was a horse tilled garden. Yes, I didn't grow up that long ago, but my dad preferred horses because they didn't pack down the garden soil. So our horse actually pulled a tiller behind it and we'd spread manure on the garden, a half acre garden, 11 kids and dad worked every single day in the garden. And it was rows with irrigation water and so forth. We don't have irrigation water in Diamond Valley. And if you think you're gonna water it well enough with city tap water, um, piped water, like me, you're paying a few extra dollars a month to dump that much extra water on the soil. So there needs to be something to retain the water. Because the first year, dug the rows, ran the water down it. You cannot get enough water on my soil. I'm worried it's sandy loam and it soaks in real quick. You can't get enough water on it to grow a garden. It's not possible to run it down a row and do that. So this method actually takes a ton less water. It still needs a ton of amendments to get our soil built up. So that's probably another con. Can you think of any other downsides to no-till gardening that I haven't mentioned here? No-till options overview. We're gonna take a quick look at lots of different kinds of raised beds. We're gonna take a look at some of the on-ground options um, because you don't have to go to the work of building a raised bed. You just mow down the grass, cover it, and wait. We are not gonna talk about big farming. One of the cons that was listed was big farming has to buy specialized equipment to pierce the soil to plant the seeds, whereas it's softer soil for normal seed planting. And so the conversion was a little expensive for big farming. We're not gonna worry about that. Quick overview of flat till, uh, flat ground no-till getting started. First, clear any of the debris off of that section, including any rocks. The guidance was anything bigger than, or than a hen's egg. I actually raked the area. I didn't want any rocks in my way because uh, you get a root trying to grow around a rock and it's a small plant, it's probably still too big. So I raked all the rocks out of the way. Then add a thick, layer of compost, four inches at least, organic matter. Um, two weeks ago, we talked about some of the options on compost. I'm a dump it on the ground person. I dig a trench, dump all of the 
kitchen waste, yard waste in that trench and bury the trench as I go. Why do I do it that way? I've tried the tumblers. I've tried to layer it in a small place. That still was too much work for me to want to turn it over and, and play with that and keep enough water on it. And I found the fastest way to take care of that compostable matter was just to dig a trench and dump it in it, in the garden space or in a future garden space. Because within two or three years, the worms have taken care of it as long as you don't fill it too deep of the same exact kind of stuff. And, and it's done fine. I've had the biggest squash plants grow in trench compost. <laughs> okay, so you got Jenny's manure for her horses. And you said you're gonna let that sit for at least a year? Uh-huh. So did you dig a hole and just dump it in? It's on top of the ground. I didn't, well, initially, yes. I had a trench that was about tractor bucket wide and I dumped it in and, and so it was what you'd call kind of underground. Now I've just left it on the ground and, and left it for a year. Okay. So the worms are gonna do the work, but you do keep it wet? It only gets wet if it's near enough one of my other sprinklers. But the manure, that manure was already pretty old when I moved it. It was six months to a year old when I moved it. And that's, yeah. Yeah, that first load though, it was old. It was real old. <laughs> and then I picked it up again this year, not to my house, to the neighbor's house. <laughs> so. Horse manure alone, it's probably not optimal, but interestingly, we grew 200 pounds of sweet potatoes in a raised bed filled half with horse manure and half with just plain old junk soil. So whatever you can get, there's plenty of people with horses here in the valley. There's plenty of people with big horses and big cattle. Clydesdales and and so forth that are just pil piling their poop up. So lots of options on that one. If your material is not composted and for the last two years, some of you may have noticed that I just put a note out on Facebook and said, are you raking up your leaves and throwing them in the trash? Throw them in my trailer instead. And I covered my garden for the last two years in eight inches of leaves. So if it's not composted, it needs to be at least eight inches deep. In the fall, in the next spring, it's typically packed down to about four inches. Um, manure, just a side note here. If you're using manure, it's probably better to buy from somebody that you know isn't feeding um, GMO and and herbicides and all that kind of stuff into it. And the same with your compost. So I don't have a tendency just to go down to the dump and get their compost because that's getting everything that I have no idea what it is. But make your own best decision on that. We need you need plenty of amendment on it. The outcome after the winter then. That's I'm jumping one step, but we'll come back to it. It's packed down. The grass and the weeds underneath have completely rotted. They've lost their sunshine. They've lost their ability to grow through. And the garden last year where it was completely covered with eight inches of um, leaves, and again this year, I had almost no weeds. One or two of the marshmallow that shoots its roots down forever deep and then manages to find it eight to 12 inches up <laughs> uh, and those few just got dug out, no big deal. But I didn't have tons of weeds to clear out of that area. And the grass, the little bit of grass in that area had completely composted. If you've got a serious root mat, you're still gonna have to cut through the root mat where you plant your seeds, but that's all. Ben? I wanted to know how you kept your weeds from blowing away. My garden is completely surrounded with chicken wire. 
two reasons. First, it's eight foot tall, so the deer can't get in there. Second, it's all the way to the ground and under, so the rabbits and the guineas can't get in until I let the guineas in. Guineas don't scratch very much, but they will scratch enough to disturb new plants as they're growing. So I don't let them in the garden until I see the first squash bugs and everything's up tall enough to survive their tromping around. And, the, and your leaves don't blow against the fence? I, they don't seem to move much. No. no, because it's already, the leaves are pretty much packed by the time they get in there because some people pick them up with a lawnmower, which yeah. chews them up pretty good. And the ones that I got that weren't picked up with a lawnmower, I tromped them, packed them enough as I moved them that they didn't blow around much. So good question though. If the, the leaves you would typically see if they're just flat on the ground, they're up against every fence line. But no, these have been moved and, and they are pretty packed in. You can optionally lay a layer of cardboard on that soil. Uh, for most of the online videos, they show wetting cardboard, laying it down, making your rows with it and so forth. There's a lot of cardboard options in, in uh, no-till gardening. I tried it, I didn't like it. I found that the cardboard limited the root aeration of my bigger plants and roots have to get air. What's the major thing I see in city landscaping? Lay down that big old cloth around the tree, put a ton of rock on it, and you just cut off its air source and you cut off its cooling source and you've superheated those roots. And then two years later, the tree's struggling and dying and you're going, why did that tree die? Just because you just blocked its air, still getting water, but there's no aeration going through and it's superheating because that black rock on top is pulling the heat in to the soil. So just a, a principle of let nature do what nature typically does. Don't dump rock on places where you still want to get air uh, in there. I mentioned this already. Any weeds you have are super easy to pull. They just don't have anything to grab onto. It's not packed soil down there that they managed to get to. They're, they're putting their roots out in the same place the plants are putting out in which is unpacked leaves, compost, and so forth. And I've got one area that, just as an example of how easy the weeds are to pull, I've got a hundred foot of rose bushes along the side that had horses in it. And I covered three foot on each side of the rose bush with six inches of uh, wood chips. There were still some weeds because anything as it breaks down and the weed seed blows in, manages to, a few of them come up, but they just pop right out. There's no, because the roots are still in the mulch and, and it's really easy to weed. So we mentioned cardboard paths and planting. I like cardboard for paths. You don't have to cover as much. Uh, then whatever you've got, to cover with, whether that be hay, straw, leaves, um, wood chips, then three inches is plenty to keep the weeds from coming through. You've got enough cardboard underneath there to, so just lay it down and, and uh, overlap it so that there's not a place for the sunlight to get through and it'll, it'll work for that. Then in the plantable area, so my garden is laid out right now with two foot rows and a drip line on the row. So I'm not spraying anywhere. I'm just using a, a drip line, trying to save a little water. I've got enough other things that use a lot of water. <laughs> I don't need to use a ton more water on the garden. And the paths are packed down. When I plant, I just pull back enough of that mulch to plant in the soil. Um, or better yet, 
prepare your seedlings or your plug trays or whatever and plant, transplant in those areas. Mulches can include compost, leaves, moldy leaves, hay, wood chips, grass clippings, sawdust, straw, anything organic. Anything. If you see the truck that's in here chipping trees and they're willing to dump it in Diamond Valley, you say, hey, dump it right there and move it to where it needs to go. Um, so it doesn't matter what, what the mulch is. If you want it to look real pretty, you can buy that beautiful red mulch at Home Depot. I don't have a tendency to do that. It's not looking pretty after a year. <laughs> so, and its purpose is to grow food. I want to just give an example of potato planting and what our experience was in planting potatoes in old hay. I forget who, but someone had a fair amount of moldy old hay and we had some straw from some projects and I just bunched it up eight inches deep. And here's the fun thing with hay or even leaves. To plant the potatoes, you don't even bring a shovel with you. You pull back the leaves or the hay. I use my fingers to make sure I'm clear to the ground. I pull maybe an inch of the soil out to create a, a nest there to make sure that the potato is actually sitting in the ground. And I just cover it back up again. Planted, done. Now, fast forward. You do have to make sure your water source is good. Um, I had it on a drip system. That line uh, got some damage and I didn't realize it. So I lost a couple of weeks of solid water in the middle of summer. And I started seeing those poor potato plants just wilt. Uh, it was where I could see them, side of the driveway. I was going in and out, found the problem. I don't think it still had enough water though. That really hit it. So make sure that the water is, is solid and there's enough soaking your hay or leaves because you don't want it to be drying out in the area where the roots are going to be moving. And the potatoes are actually stored in the hay. So harvest time, I've heard of some people, in fact, we did a little bit. We went out and harvested a few of the potatoes just by pushing aside the, the hay, finding a potato, picking it, and cooking it. You don't have to dig the plant. When it came time for um, fall, the potato tops were drying out. We simply went out, picked up and pulled up on the plant itself. Do you ever do that in a, in a till garden? No, you'd lose where to dig, wouldn't you? <laughs> but on this one, the potatoes stayed intact. You pull it up out of the ground, you pluck the potatoes off, put it in the box, drop the plant and move to the next one. It is so quick to harvest potatoes, this method. And as long as there's enough composted nutrients there, potatoes are nutrient hungry. They love lots of nutrients. So layer of compost, whatever kind you can find, layer of manure, another layer of compost, another layer of manure, another layer of compost, but get enough manure in there so that you've actually got some um, nutrition for those potatoes to grow on. Do you have this in a sunny area or can be somewhat shaded? Um, that one was shaded from noon on because of neighbor's trees. And I'm guessing that was part of the reason because the ones in the garden that I, we grew the same method, those were huge. The potatoes were, were full size, huge. And again, just as easy to harvest. Just uh, our yard, when we built there, had voles. Anybody else got voles in their yard? I don't know where the vole is. A ground mouse. 
thought they were gophers. Well, you could call it a gopher, but it's not truly a gopher. It's a vole. Okay, we have smaller. Yeah. They they are cute as can be, but they're nighttime. They are. They eat the roots of the trees. They eat the roots of everything, and we got a couple of them that found our potato patch and ate a few potatoes. They didn't eat that much because they were growing up in the mulch, and these guys like to stay safely underground. Um, but they've eaten the bottoms of bean plants and everything else. It is so hard to kill them off. I have tried poison. I've tried gassing them out with an exhaust from the vehicle. Uh, I've tried all of the methods I could see online. None of them have wiped them out. They always come back twice as many the next year. So raised beds has been my best option to take care of the voles because they will not. Um, well, I'll mention a couple things on different raised beds as we go to them. So raised beds for no-till gardening. A few principles first. You simply don't turn over the soil. I've done it. You climb up on that raised bed, you dig it, turn it over, and you go, boy, this is a waste of time. And you're up on top of a raised bed. Um, still plant your seeds at the recommended depth. Make sure you have a water source. All those principles that are there. But I love following the square foot gardening methods for that one. 12, 13 years ago, a 10 by 20 greenhouse that I just built out of plastic and hoops um, with raised beds in it pretty much took care of our family needs in a small, small greenhouse. So how many of you have already done square foot gardening type principles and reading. If you haven't read that book, that's the one book I would buy. I wouldn't necessarily build the soil the way he did it. I think that putting that much money into four different kinds of manure and vermiculite and so forth is probably unneeded. I did the first time. And then we sold the house a year later and there went hundreds of dollars of vermiculite and <laughs> everything else. <laughs> and I haven't bought any since then, and my soil is holding moisture just fine because it's the amendments that hold the soil, not the vermiculite. Garage door raised beds. Anybody heard of them before? Seen them? Lots and lots of garage door replacement people here in St. George. One of them used to live in the valley. And do we still have a phone number to his family member? I called him and said, hey, you get more cows like that. I don't think we want them. And his response was, we don't get them like that very often. Right. And that's half truth. The other half is we don't want to mess with doing anything but calling them to the dump because they quit recycling them. Um, I think with enough influence, like I'll pay you $20 a panel and I'll pick them up myself, it might make a difference, I don't know. <laughs> but it's my favorite raised bed. And I have two that I paid for and six that I didn't pay for. <laughs> and they are wonderful. The panels that you need, and I don't know if you can tell from this one, it's metal on both sides and it's insulated in the middle. It's a really, really strong panel. Uh, and then all you do is throw a corner on it and put wood to tie them together. If it's a super long panel, there's a wire in the middle of it from center to center to keep it from bulging out. But I haven't had any problem. They're just structurally very, very strong. Uh, this particular raised bed, you can't see. It was just replanted everything. We've got garlic growing along the side. There's um, tons of stuff coming up right now in it, but I love the garage door raised bed panel. And it's a wonderful, simple, light, easy to build raised bed. Uh, I don't know if you can see it here. I turned 
cinder blocks on their side underneath to get it up eight more inches. It was two foot and I wanted it two foot eight so that I wasn't bending over. And just make it match you, whatever that is. The other thing is whatever you're gonna put into it, realize that compost of any kind, horse manure, whatever it is, is going to compress down. You're gonna to have to add to it second year. So if you're gonna buy um, soil in bags, even that will compress down some. You'll be buying more next year. But with all the horses and other options around here, see what options you can find. Cinder block raised beds. Anybody built cinder block raised beds? I had an inexpensive source of cinder blocks. Next door neighbor moving, wanted his yard cleaned up. I learned how to pour a foot in and use cinder blocks. <laughs> Not my favorite thing to do. They're heavy, but they make an excellent raised bed. I've got a 17 foot one on one side of the backyard facing south. That south, that south, I was between them when I took these pictures. And this one has peas in it right now. Um, and it will have sweet potatoes in it. A 30 foot long raised bed because I should have backed off just a little bit. It's three and a half foot high from the grass and the sun hits that side all the time. And so it warms up earlier than any other soil in my yard. And it cools off in the fall, the very last. So sweet potatoes up here in Diamond Valley thrive in that raised bed. We got 200 pounds of sweet potatoes out of that 30 foot raised bed last year. And the greens, which are actually edible. Did you know you can eat sweet potato greens, uh, cook them like spinach or whatever? Um, Could you throw them in a blender? Um, we tried them, they're a little green tasting, but they weren't too bad. We tried them as a, as a smoothie. Huh? Nothing. <laughs> yeah. You just should probably eat a lot of stuff that isn't nice too. Well, one of my favorite sandwiches, natural, is mustard greens for the mustard. And uh, I forget what the, oh, the cheese was made from um, sunflower seeds. And it was green cheese because of some interaction of the sunflower seeds. It was wonderful tasting. I could not believe how good <laughs> that mustard sandwich was. <laughs> but that's what's growing right now. The mustard greens are just finishing right now. They're just turning to seed. But I've been picking mustard greens for probably four weeks now. And that's what's growing. That's what cleans out your liver in the spring is the greens that are growing outside right now. So, uh, Good. yes. So, um, what soil do you put in, in these? Just where they need to live? Yeah. Because this, because you do the same thing, right? You just put all the compost Well, on these two, I learned some hard lessons. This one got built first. I put fresh cow manure in it and mixed it 50-50. What's wrong with cow manure? It's real hot. It took a full year before anything could survive in it. <laughs> but once that year was up, oh my goodness, everything's just going like crazy. And it had to be added to because manures just compress. And, and watering them in a raised bed helps it mulch down. Added a few worms to help the, the mulching. But this is not a professionally done, this is an experiment with it, make it work type thing. That one, horse manure, um, topsoil, mixed it with the bucket of the tractor because that's 30 foot long and four foot wide. I am not hauling that with a wheelbarrow. And so he got pushed back and forth with the bucket of the tractor a couple of times and dumped and raised it. <laughs> and 200 pounds of sweet potatoes was the result. 
So is horse manure less hot than cow manure? Yeah, and I still prefer that it age a year, but I have grown things in it without it aged at all. What do horses typically eat? Alfalfa and grass. And a cow chews its cud, so it's double chewed, and a lot more acid, a lot hotter. Whereas a horse, one time it's through. What's the downside to horse manure? Weeds, seeds don't die because it doesn't get double chewed. <laughs> so you end up weeding quite a bit in that. But sweet potatoes cover it completely within weeks after you plant it and you stop weeding. And then I wish I'd found it. I, I looked for it today and couldn't find it, but I've got a picture of last year's sweet potatoes. And on the back side of this, I had a four foot fence that I pushed the um, vines up so that they wouldn't cover my entire sidewalk. Because sweet potatoes will throw a vine out that's about 12 foot long. It's beautiful. It is gorgeous. And, and the front side cascaded down for that whole front side. It's just absolutely gorgeous. Yeah. You're varieties too. You don't have that kind of space. Uh, yes. And we looked at varieties that would take less uh, time to mature. And it was okay. We're actually growing the, the slips right now inside the house. And we've got four different varieties. So we're gonna try uh, sweet potatoes in three different locations this year. Because they produce so well if you can get enough heat to them. And I happen to have a uh, greenhouse, which I didn't bring any pictures of, but it's got enough raised bed in there to feed four families. And I'm gonna do some sweet potatoes in there and just see what it does. So that's cinder block. Uh, if you haven't done it before, I would not do cinder block. I would do concrete or anything else, but cinder block is a lot of work. So why are you so high on sweet potatoes? Sweet potatoes and their nutrition value. Different bodies need different things. My body loves sweet potatoes. My wife loves russet potatoes. I can't stand russet potatoes. Give me a third of one and I've topped up, I can't eat another bite. But a sweet potato, you can eat it raw, like carrot sticks. You can eat it um, oven fried. You can eat it as a boiled, mashed um, oven as a whole. I mean, there's so much more nutrition in a sweet potato than there is in a regular potato. And the glycemic index is low. It's not a high glycemic index. So you don't recommend microwaving? I don't recommend microwaving anything. Thank you for asking that question. <laughs> Guess how many microwaves we have in our house? Zero microwaves in our house. The RV, the microwave got took out and we put it air fryer in that space that fit the same space. I don't use microwaves. What, you ask the question, I'm going to tell a quick story. We had a neighbor when we lived in Nevada who always heard about how bad microwaves were and he said, I think it's a bunch of baloney. I'm going to try an experiment. He bought a dozen baby chicks he put them in two separate enclosures. One group of them got regular food, regular water. The other group of six baby chicks got regular food, water after it had been microwaved and cooled. That's the only change he made. Just microwaved the water and cooled it. Two weeks, doing well, all dead. <laughs> you don't have to listen to the story. Do your own experiment. Microwave everything for three weeks and see how you feel. <laughs> we don't do a microwave in our house. 
All right. Um, wood raised beds. How do you like your wood raised beds? I don't have any that are just plain wood right now just because I could got everything else free, but how do you like your wood raised beds? What do you treat the wood with to make sure that it doesn't rot down with this water and soil against it? So half of my wood raised beds are probably 12 years old. They were built by the prior owner. And they're weathered, but they're not rotting, and they're not falling apart. They're working a little bit. But the ones that I built, I use lead seed oil. <clears throat> yeah, we just have to make sure and protect it, preserve it, or use redwood or something like that that doesn't fall apart as quick. But they're beautiful. They're pretty quick to build. Um, if you want to see some beautiful raised beds out of wood, the pallet ones are beautiful that Barbara's got. So They don't look like pallets. People are surprised that those are pallets. Yeah, free materials, a little bit of labor, of course, <laughs> but free materials. And uh, how long would you say it takes to build a pallet raised bed? If you have tools, because I didn't need a miter saw. Probably two hours, because I'm slow to build a four by eight. Okay, not bad. And plenty of pallets available. So free raised beds. And then linseed oil, um, $100 for five gallons, and that'll cover a lot of space. And I did buy some treated four by fours so I could put corners. In the corners, yes. Yeah, and treated four by fours are not terribly expensive either. So stock tanks in buckets method. How many of you have seen this one? I wish I'd brought a couple of process pictures, but let me walk through it. Uh, so the stock tank is set face up. The buckets are set bottom up inside of it. Drill some holes in so that the water can get up into them and the same in the bottom of the bucket. So it's just a bucket there raising the base of the soil up about halfway and it's packed in there as tight as you can pack five gallon buckets. Depending on the height of the bucket, um, depends on how much soil is on top. Then a ground cloth is tucked in between the buckets and you fill it with the best soil you can get. You drill like Huh? Buyers. Yeah, exactly. This one here, um, when Kyle and Christy moved, the new owners didn't want any of the raised beds, any of the stock tank stuff. So they were trying to clear it out of the yard. And there's a drain hole just barely below the top of the buckets so that the water doesn't get up and stay on the roots. And there's a PVC fill tube that you can see right here that has an angle cut on the bottom so it doesn't um, limit the flow of water in. Once a week, roughly, you put a hose down there, watch it come out the drain hole, turn it off. It uses very little water. The roots. So there are buckets in there. There's buckets underneath all of them. Uh, about to this height. What kind of buckets? Just plain old, cheap as you can find it. Uh, five gallon. Five gallon. Yeah. And then the cloth or fabric or whatever you call that. It's really heavy stuff. It's heavy. It's it's a heavy cloth. It's not. It's a. Uh, so are those now in your yard? Mm -hmm. So we can walk over there and see your Yes, and I actually have uh, two of them that are not set up, so I can show you how they go together. The fabric, tell me about the fabric. It's not just plastic. It's not a tarp. 
it's it's got to the, do the roots go through it into the water? Um, very little. The the roots. Um, but the water can the mist or whatever. The, the water wicks up the soil that's packed. If you can picture this, there's a bucket, there's a space in between it. You actually push that fabric down a little bit so that it's down that far in between those spaces. And that's filled with soil. So the plants that want their roots in water can do that. And the ones that don't, don't. They stay up out of the water. So when we harvest or when we took these apart, there was a big matting of roots under one type of plant down in the water. And the others had all stayed up on the top. The, the roots had gone, no, I don't need that much water. I'm staying up. So he gets to choose. It's a weird concept. The other person that's done it for a couple of years here is Quinn Carter, which lives just on that side of the park. And he's got probably four big round ones, the 10 foot round ones or whatever. This is our first time with it, but you can't see it. There's red lettuce, more green lettuce just coming up the room, and then green lettuce on this end. So it's, uh, it's effective and it uses really little water, almost none in, for this environment here. So, so probably its biggest benefit is its low water use. And these tanks are two or three years old. They don't show anywhere. And the no, buckets last forever, so. But they're, they're full, so the water it fills up, not just the five gallon buckets, but everything. Yes, so, everything. so the water is up to roughly this level. Yeah, all the way across, all the way through. Yeah, all the way through, so I it's. Was, I was just wondering if, if it's possible to build them because those tanks are pretty darn expensive. $150 for this tank. Mm -hmm. I looked at the pricing of the tank. So a six foot one, uh, 149, something like that, an eight foot one, 179. So not terrible. And the buckets, if you can find the right place. Yeah, 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 and, and get them free. Uh, and then the, the fabric, is a roll of fabric. Um, is the fabric reusable every year? The fabric stays in it. You never, you never change this out. It's there. Yeah. yeah. I just was trying to think in my head a way of building a different one. It's something else where you fill the buckets, but you don't fill the hood. And they <laughs> haven't come up with it yet. Yeah. Yeah, this methodology is long lasting. I, I'm going to guess that stock tank will last 12 or 15 years. Because they do on the ground, right? That's what a stock tank typically lasts. They're yeah, they're galvanized. So that method grows a lot of food. And um, these were all transplanted. So they didn't get exactly square foot space, but they're pretty close to that. Uh, and there will be enough lettuce there to keep us going because I don't harvest whole heads of lettuce. You pick one leaf off this one and one off that one every day and it takes over and you've got enough lettuce for salad every day because we did that all winter long in our greenhouse. We ate salads every day from the greenhouse because the greenhouse didn't, doesn't freeze. This is about no-till gardening. I probably could have spent some time on the greenhouse too, but okay, I didn't. Fred, I'm going to say, that stock thing has got buckets, five-gallon buckets, right next to each other. Yep. And then you fill the whole thing with, with water. But, well, you fill it from the bucket bottom up because the buckets are inverted. And so it's flat across the top of the buckets for the most part. But and you, you have holes in the yeah. bottom of the bucket, which is on the top. So that the water can come up all the way and the air can escape. Otherwise, the buckets would float up and be really hard to get full <laughs> of water. So the plant, so there is dirt in the buckets or no? No dirt in the buckets. The, okay. the dirt is limited by the fabric 
to only go into the fabric. Where's the fact is on top of the buckets? Yes. And and tucked in the sides a little bit. Just and the dirt's placed on top of that. Yep. So how thick is your dirt? Like what? Not eight, eight to ten inches at the most. If you use six gallon buckets, eight inches. If you use five gallon buckets, maybe two inches deeper than that. If you use three and a half gallon buckets, you're getting another two or whatever inches on top of that. So depending on what you want to plant in there, think about the depth of the roots. So the, the plant roots does not go inside the bucket at all. No. Those are round. Um, it, yeah. yeah, yeah, and it and it stays pretty much in the soil. Lettuce doesn't put that deeper roots down. If you want to plant twelve inch carrots, you better use a three and a half gallon bucket. <laughs> so, water goes in that too. The water is the same as the the buckets are providing space similar to an underground reservoir of water, and the water permeates. It just Wicks up. Because you've drilled holes into the bottom of the bucket, which now is on top, the air goes out and the water just fills up all the way. <clears throat> yeah, come and see it. It's, I've got some that are not set up. It's really a simple design, but it's harder to explain than, than that. Anything that'll hold water, you could use a kiddie pool, I suppose, but that wouldn't last very long because the plastic breaks down. <laughs> Stock tanks definitely are more uh, solid. So you only water once a week? I, yeah, because the water doesn't evaporate anywhere, really. I mean, there's very little evaporation and there's no penetration into the soil. She's just saying old bathtubs. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. An old bathtub. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If if uh <laughs> that would be the cutest garden I can imagine. Fifteen old bathtubs with a toilet beside everyone on them. Yeah. That would be totally cute. Uh. Same principles as regular gardening for all of this. You want to grow vertical if you can. Run it upwards so that you've got space to, to grow everything. Make sure you ensure reliable water. This is last year's peas. I got a good picture of them last year. I had so many peas in that raised bed that I grew sweet potatoes in. And they were running up a, a fence line. And by the time the peas finish because you plant the peas we planted them in february and they're they're almost ready to start putting on peas right now they've, they've got good sized flowers on them within a week there will be peas on them uh, but we had so many peas and then you can barely see it in this picture but there's sweet potatoes that i had planted in between that two rows of peas and just as the peas finished, the sweet potatoes took over the raised beds. So you can multi-use the, the space. So when do you plant your sweet potatoes? As soon as there is absolutely zero risk of frost, so mid-May. Because my potatoes look beautiful and then they frost it. So yeah. will they recover or they're dead? Yeah. I yep. stop planting. I mean watering. <laughs> yeah, because it it has to have it it has to have protection from the frost so potatoes sweet potatoes tomatoes what else is very sensitive to frost the the fruit that we just lost with last week's freeze <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah uh, all of our stuff is still inside the greenhouse or inside the house right now. We're not putting any of those sensitive ones out for another three weeks probably until the last risk of frost is gone. Mother's Day is supposed to be our last risk of frost. When's the last time we've seen a frost? Two weeks after that. 
Yeah. <laughs> so we're, we're the cautious crowd. Um, my neighbor behind me has a bunch of water, what do you call them? Water walls, wall, wall of water. And so she's already put out her tomatoes and everything. But go try and buy a six pack of wall of water right now. I think she said they're $30 for a six pack. They used to be 12 for a six pack. This year they're 30. So that's not an option for us to want to use that for two weeks and store it for a year to use it for two weeks or three weeks. A few resources and I'm done and we're definitely out of time. Um, there is some pretty good guides online. Uh, GrowVeg.com guides no-till gardening, an easier way to grow. There's a Facebook group I'm following that's just a no-till gardening Facebook group and they post a video every week of methodology and they share ideas. So there's a couple of them there. Books by the ton on no-till gardening. You'd think I would have bought two or three books. That's typically my method. I'll read two or three books and I'll just jump in based on principles. This time I just got tired of digging and I started playing. <laughs> so I am not an expert on this one. So if you want really to learn all the principles or somebody else's opinions, Read one of two or three dozen books. Absolutely, I recommend at least understanding the principles of square foot gardening for density of planting, because that gives you an opportunity to use your space to the greatest amount. Until we moved to Diamond Valley and had an acre, we were on quarter acres at two different places for the 15 years before that and there was plenty of space in a quarter acre using square foot gardening to feed a whole family even in st george where we were on we were down in the slick rock area the um, dinosaur crossing area our property was on rock it was slick rock in the back slick rock under the house slick rock in the front it was all rock i built raised beds and we actually produced on a quarter acre, 80% of what we needed with raised beds. So the, the principles work, the opportunity to save your back is probably a big portion of it because most of us are working full time and trying to get food out of a garden. <laughs> or if we're not working full time, we're trying to get food out of garden and do a lot of other things. And so it's nice to not have to turn over the soil and do a lot of those backbreaking labors. Questions, comments? All right. You can come take a look around. And if you come and bring work gloves and maybe a trailer to haul away trash, I'll get you busy. No. <laughs> There's plenty of work to do back there right now. I've still got